Out of all the London Underground lines, the Metropolitan is the most unique as it provides express services at peak times to and from central London. We will get to see a train run express during the morning peak all the way to Allgate on the boundary of the famous Square Mile. Our journey begins here at Amersham, which has since 1961, with the electrification of the line, been the terminus of the Metropolitan Line service. We'll be riding on board an S-stop train, classified as S8, the S standing for subsurface and the 8 for the number of coaches that are provided. Trains that terminate at Amersham reverse in one of the two sidings just west of the station, before continuing back into central London. There is an odd number of platforms here. Platform 1 to our far right is used by Chiltern Railway Services to Aylesbury. Platform 2, just next to us, is used to terminate Metropolitan trains. And Platform 3, which we arrive at, is for all southbound services. At first, our train is running over the former Metropolitan and Great Central Joint Line, which was opened all the way to Aylesbury in September 1892, after which in January 1897, the route was extended to Verney Junction. The station at Quainton Road was where the two companies parted way. There was even a branch to Brill that had opened as the Brill Tramway in 1871, soon taken in hand by the Metropolitan also diverging from Quainton Road, running for six and a half miles. Verney Junction was located on the so-called Varsity Line between Oxford and Cambridge, though quite frankly that station along with others at Brill, Waddesdon Manor, Cranborough Road and Winslow Road were in the middle of the sticks with a few houses to its name. The services beyond Aylesbury were a failure, with London Transport curtailing passenger trains in July 1936 while the services to Brill ceased a year earlier in November 1935. Trains on the Metropolitan continued in operation to Aylesbury until electrification reached Amersham in 1961, while only five years after that, the infamous Dr Beeching closed the Great Central Main Line north of Aylesbury in 1966. The single line to the left is the Chesham branch, which we will be travelling over later. In fact, the Metropolitan Railway opened there first before Amersham in July 1889. The Bay platform still exists to our left and used to terminate the Chesham shuttle service. The platform however is no longer in railway commission as it can't accommodate the eight coach S stock trains. First station is Chalfont and Latimer, the station being in a good location for intending passengers to alight and explore the Chess Valley. 
Until 1915, this station was known as Chalfont Road, the village of Latimer being over a mile distance from here. We are travelling through the area of Metroland, a name that was coined in the 20th century by the Met's marketing department to promote modern homes in the beautiful countryside of Buckinghamshire, Hertfordshire and Middlesex. The railway company had been in a privileged position, being allowed to retain surplus land. From 1919 this was developed for housing by the nominally independent Metropolitan Railway Country Estates Limited. The spirit of Metroland was evoked by the poet Sir John Betjeman, recalling this in his autobiography, Summoned by Bells, released in 1960, that Metroland beckoned us out to lanes in beachy bucks. Notice that many signals are awaiting to be commissioned. With automatic train operation expected to be all over the Metropolitan Line, this section still has to be signalled for the Chiltern trains. Chorley Wood was originally just two separate words. A suffix was installed to the name in 1915 called Chorley Wood and Cheney's, lasting until 1934, by which time the name had merged to become one. pass under the M25, London's orbital motorway. This, along with the central line at Epping, are the only two underground lines to penetrate its boundary.
This is a banner repeater signal, a signal you would see on the National Rail Network, albeit with LED lighting. When displayed in the diagonal position, it tells the driver that the starting signal, which is obscured around the bend, is showing a proceed aspect. In the horizontal, the signal is at danger or showing a red. This banner repeater and the one just before Rickmansworth station are the only two on the underground. We pass one of the Chiltern Railway's Class 165 Turbo DMUs, operating on a service from London Marlebone to Aylesbury Vale Parkway. This is the only place in the country where a network rail train operating company comes under the control of a rapid transit signalling system. Rickmansworth was the extremity of the Metropolitan's electrification in 1925 and this was where the traction was changed from the vintage electric locos on the Metropolitan to steam trains being provided by the LNER. The Metropolitan service continued with steam power to Aylesbury and Watford until 1961 when the final section of the route was electrified to Amersham, eliminating the need for steam power over the line. The British rail trains however did continue north beyond Aylesbury to destinations such as Leicester and Sheffield until 1966. past the Rickmansworth carriage sidings. The double track diverging to the right forms one part of a triangular junction with the Watford branch, even though this side of the triangle is mainly used by empty rolling stock to access the carriage sidings at Rickmansworth. side or the passenger use side of the triangle now appears as we pass over the Grand Union Canal. This stretch from Pinner to Rickmansworth was opened on the first day of September 1887.
We are now approaching Moor Park. The station lies in the grandly named Moor Park Estate, with large houses that depict the Metroland Idyll. The station was opened in 1910 as Sandy Lodge after the nearby Sandy Lodge Golf Course, changing the name to Moor Park in 1950. The residents of the area were up in arms as they had strongly opposed to the quadrupling of the railway and rebuilding of the station that was completed in 1961. This is the beginning of the Metropolitan's express services into London and we now run non-stop to Harrow on the Hill. station is the first in the Greater London area. The station once had a goods depot but has since 1966 been demolished and is now a car park. All that remains is a siding which was where the old subsurface trains of the A and C stock were loaded onto lorries to be scrapped. Iron Bridge crosses the A404 Rickmansworth Road. Hills, the most recent addition to the Metropolitan, dating from the 13th of November 1933. Class 165 turbos on Chiltern services must conform to the standard LUL signalling practices. The diesels are fitted with trip cocks which will prevent a signal being passed at danger. There was once two stations that served Pinner, the other opened in 1842, located on the West Coast Main Line. 
although since 1920 that station has been renamed as Hatch End and is served by London Overground services on the Watford DC line. On the 25th of May 1885 the line was projected north of Harrow to Pinner and later the railway was strengthened to four tracks amidst heavy protests by local residents. Construction work started in 1956 and completed in 1962. Also in 1925 the line was electrified to Rickmansworth where the steam locos of the Metropolitan coupled up to the coaches to continue the trains to Amersham and Aylesbury etc. This is North Harrow. We will wait at this signal, Juliet Bravo 45 slash 46 for a few minutes to allow slower local services to clear the junction. On the approach to Harrow, the Uxbridge branch emerges by means of a burrowing junction. We shall be taking this route later. Thank you. 
station is Harrow on the Hill. Change for Metropolitan Line services to Uxbridge and National Rail services. And so we arrive at Harrow on the Hill, the terminus from Wilsdon Green on the 2nd of August 1880, and as such was called Harrow. It was in 1894 that the long-winded suffix of on the hill was added, even though the proper town of Harrow on the Hill is located to the south, the station being at the foot of the hill, which at the time of opening was in a small hamlet called Green Hill. The town is a busy railhead with a large bus station located alongside the main station entrance, with routes serving various parts of London, including Heathrow Airport. Platforms 3 to 6 are used by Metropolitan Line trains throughout the day, the Chiltern Turbos using platforms 1 and 2. Having picked up the early morning commuters from Harrow, we set off again running fast to Finchley Road. Northwick Park opened in 1923 and had the suffix Kenton after it. It was dropped in 1937, no doubt to avoid confusion with passengers of the other station called Kenton on the Bakerloo line, which incidentally is only a few hundred yards away. The train crosses the Bakerloo and London Overground lines and the four tracks of the West Coast Main Line. Surprisingly, the island platform at Preston Road wasn't opened with the line in 1880, but in 1908, a few years after the line was electrified to Uxbridge. The station was opened as a halt, known as Preston Road Halt for Uxenden and Kenton, serving the local clay pigeon shooting site for the Olympic Games. The Jubilee Line now appears from yet another burrowing junction that dates from 1939, taking the line a further five miles to Stanmore. This was the last branch to be built by the Metropolitan Railway as a private company, opening in December 1932, just seven months before all of London Underground's buses, trams, tubes and trolley buses came under the umbrella of the London Passenger Transport Board.
Wembley Park was completely rebuilt in 2007, concurrent with the building of the nearby Wembley Stadium. The station was opened in 1894, 14 years after the rest of the line. The two separate fast and slow lines merge into one, and it's the Jubilee Line trains that now call at all intermediate stations between Wembley Park and Finchley Road. left we can see Neasden Depot on the Metropolitan Line, dating from 1882, having opened from its former carriage works at Edgware Road. The depot is where heavy overhauls and maintenance is carried out on the S-Dock trains from all of the subsurface lines, but is also where certain Jubilee 1996 tube stock trains can stable outside service hours. Just before Neasden is the bridge carrying the six lanes of the North Circular Road, while at the same time out of sight on our right is where one of two main routes of Chiltern Railways converge. Neasden opened with the original line in 1880. Dollis Hill Station. From Finchley Road to Harrow, the line was progressively quadrupled, with the Met having fast and slow lines between 1913 and 1915, the layout being reorganised with the takeover of Bakerloo Line services 24 years later. Wilsdon Green was the northernmost terminus of the Metropolitan Railway for just under a year. It had opened from Swiss Cottage in June 1879. In common with Neaston, there are four platforms, two of which face the Metropolitan, although no services are actually scheduled to call here. Now past Kilburn Station. The line crosses the North London Line.
This is West Hampstead. On our far right, the Chiltern Main Line descends into tunnel towards Marlebone. The route opened by the Great Central Railway, the last traditional main line to be built in Britain, dating from 1899. We've now arrived at Finchley Road, where cross-platform interchange is provided with the Jubilee. This is where the conventional signalling ends, and while passengers board and exit the train, our driver will change the s stock system from manual to automatic train operation. The Bakerloo Line services commence running from Baker Street to Stanmore in November 1939, with the Jubilee taking over nearly 40 years later in May 1979. Line is now underground all the way to Aldgate. Our train enters the first of a few single line tunnels to Baker Street. The this second the track wasn't added until 1873. The next station is Baker Street. There were three intermediate stations between Finchley Road and Baker Street that closed between 1939 and 1940. This was the first Swiss Cottage. Both Swiss Cottage and St John's Wood reopened as deep level tube stations with the arrival of the Bakerloo Line. This was a result of congestion on the main pet lines. This part of the route formed the first northern extension of the Metropolitan Railway, once a single line route to Swiss Cottage that opened in April 1868 by the independent Metropolitan and St John's Wood Railway Company. In 1882, the St John's Wood Railway was absorbed by the Metropolitan Railway proper, headed by the chairman of the company, Sir Edward Watkin was also chairman of the Great Central, the predecessor of the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire, and the South Eastern. This was the second closed station, Marlborough Road. It remains closed to this day, not reopening to tube traffic due to low patronage. The third station to close was here at St John's Wood, latterly called Lords, named after the nearby cricket stadium. The line emerges briefly from the tunnels to cross the Regent's Canal.
On the right, we can see a sign with the letter H inside a hexagon. If the ATO fails for whatever reason, drivers can still drive the train manually, but at a reduced speed. The H board stands for hold, and drivers must stop their trains at these boards, awaiting further instructions from the ATO signalling centre based at Hammersmith. Baker Street is one of the largest stations on the whole underground system, having no less than 10 platforms. The Metropolitan seems inextricably linked with Baker Street, but before 1914 it was just a modest junction station, and the Metropolitan worked from offices dispersed across several locations in West London, and had little presence at this station. To improve efficiency, it was desired to bring all administration to one place, and this was achieved. So fronting Allsop Place, the Metropolitan Railway's new headquarters was located at Selby House. The exterior of the station was designed by C.W. Clark, being finished in 1927 and known as Chilton Court. This is Baker Street Junction, where we travel over the same tracks of the Circle and Hammersmith and City lines. This is a very historical line indeed, as from Paddington to Farringdon, we traverse the first passenger carrying underground railway in the world, opened by the Metropolitan Railway on the 10th of January 1863. Although it's not noticeably clear in the dark, the tunnels have such a wide dimension as the Great Western Railway were partners in the building of this route and laid their 7 foot broad gauge, the most generous loading gauge on the entire underground system. Great Portland Street opened as Portland Road. The name was changed in 1917. The line follows the course of the Euston and Marlebone roads as far as Farringdon. Unlike the tube railways, the Metropolitan was built by the cut and cover method, where a trench was excavated and bricked over that caused massive disruption at the time. Is Euston Square change for London Overground and National Rail Services from Euston?
Gower Street was opened with the line but renamed Euston Square in 1909. A short distance away is the former LNWR terminus at Euston and it's proposed for the future that a direct subway connection be established, saving passengers having to walk above ground. This would be especially useful as at the time of filming, High Speed 2 was being constructed which will provide a faster rail route between London and Birmingham. King's Cross and Pancras is one of the busiest interchanges on the Metropolitan, with connections to the Victoria, Northern and Piccadilly tube lines, but also the two mainline termini of King's Cross and St Pancras. As of 2021, the Underground station is the busiest on the entire London Underground, having handled up to 36.73 million passengers a year. The Metropolitan Line alone handles up to 66.8 million passengers a year. The old 1863 platforms of King's Cross remain but out of use. Today's station, with its island platform, came into commission in 1941. Behind the wall is the former King's Cross Thameslink station that closed in 2007 when a brand new station was built at St Pancras International. The Thameslink tracks travel on the so-called Widen Lines, so named because the Metropolitan Railway widened its cuttings to lay an extra set of tracks for the passage of outer suburban trains. The tracks connected with the Great Northern out of King's Cross and the St Pancras Midland lines, and today these trains still do that, with the former being recently revived back in February 2018. Widen lines now dive underneath our formation in order for them to connect with the Snow Hill Tunnel that was built by the London, Chatham and Dover Railway. The Great Northern Railway used to obtain running powers over the LCDR from 1866 to 1907. The connection with Thameslink was disconnected in 1978. The current station at Farringdon dates from the extension to Moorgate in 1865, replacing the original station of 1863, which was the first eastern terminus of the Metropolitan and located slightly further south than land now vacated by the Smithfield Cattle Market. The station was called Farringdon Street, renamed to Farringdon and High Holborn in 1922, with the appendage being dropped in 1936.
this was the first eastern extension of the Metropolitan Railway, opening to Moorgate two days before Christmas in 1865. The next station is Barbican. Exit for the Museum of London. This station opened as Aldersgate Street and had a glazed overall roof that was destroyed by World War II bombing, inspiring Sir John Betjeman to write a poem that was named Monody on the death of Aldersgate Street. The station has had various name changes, finally being called Barbican in 1968, at the same time as the Barbican housing development was being constructed. As part of the Barbican housing development that was begun in the early 1960s, the line was rerouted slightly further north in concrete tunnels. There are two bay platforms at Moorgate, used to turn back certain LUL trains during times of disruption or while engineering works are in progress. The Elizabeth Line and National Rail Services. Mind the gap between the train and the The station is close to London's financial district and the Bank of England is within easy walking distance. The station is the interchange with the Northern Line and the Great Northern and City Railway that was once a part of the Metropolitan Railway in 1913 and then to be a part of the Northern Line from 1939 until 1975. Incidentally, from 1865 to 1924, the station was known as Moorgate Street. This section of line was opened from Moorgate to Liverpool Street on the 1st of February 1875, ten years after the extension from Farringdon. This was due to the Metropolitan focusing on its outer suburban network. The next station is Liverpool Street. Change for the Central and Hallett Middle City. Keep your eyes peeled to the left of the bricked up tunnel mouth that once ran into platforms 1 and 2 at Liverpool Street Mainline Station. The modern building to our right once occupied the Bay Platform, the one-time terminus for the Metropolitan Mainline to Aylesbury. Last station before Aldgate. Liverpool Street was originally called Bishopsgate until the name was changed in 1909. Interchange is provided with the Central and Elizabeth lines, as well as the London Overground and Greater Anglia services, the latter trains using the mainline station. The final leg of our trip opened on the 18th of November 1876.
A complex junction as the Hammersmith and City Line diverges to our left. There are four platforms at Allgate. The bay platforms, number two and three, are used to terminate the Metropolitan Line, while the outer faces, numbered one and four, are used by the through services of the Circle Line. The train terminates feet away from the district line. The frontage of the station was designed by the Metropolitan Railway's architect C.W. Clark. Whilst hidden from the streets is the train shed that dates from day one. <laughs> 